morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Karen Jacobs. I'm the director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our fall 2018 course preview. Thank you all for being here. Before we begin today, I want to make sure that all of you know we have a second preview happening on Friday of this week at our Glazer Center campus, where the instructors that are teaching at that satellite will be presenting their courses. And so that we don't run out of food, I'd like to get a show of hands of how many of you are planning to attend the Glazer preview on Friday. All right, keep your hands up for a minute. Chris, are you? Yes. Thank you. All right, we will have uh, enough donuts, I promise you. Thank you. Um, as you probably noticed in our catalog for this fall, we have three kinds of classes for you this, uh, this term. Not one, not two, but three. We have our Ollie Original classes, which are six-week offerings here at Sonoma State in the Cooperage. We have our Ollie a la carte series, which are two-hour, one-time lectures that don't require a full six-week commitment. And those are offered at the Glazer Center over in downtown Santa Rosa. And finally new this term, we're presenting our Ollie off-season. For those of you that want even more Ollie and don't know what to do with yourselves when classes end, how many of you have told me, now what do I do? I have an answer for that. Ollie off-season will take place between our fall and winter terms in the beautiful new Wine Spectator Learning Center here on campus, and we'll kick off that series with everything you ever wanted to know about finance, public and private, but were afraid to ask, with Mike Arnold, who will be presenting that later this morning. So, three kinds of classes. This fall begins, it's hard to believe, my sixth year as director of the OLLI program, and I'd really like to know, A, where the six years went, and B, why I have to keep printing these notes in larger font every year. Right. Um, that first fall, we had 254 students in the program back in 2001. Now we have a community of over 1,500 students in the OLLI program, and uh, we're very proud of that. How many of you were here that first fall? in September 2001, show of hands. I see several. We appreciate loyalty, thank you very much. And how many of you are brand new to the OLLI program today? Fantastic. I love that. Welcome to what you will soon learn is a wonderful community to be a part of. Uh, we are in the midst of an effort to attract even more brand new members and to have even more new hands go up next term. So we've developed a little contest that we'd like to call Bring a Buddy, and here's how it works. The Ollie member who brings the most new students to this program this fall will win the grand prize, two tickets to Joan Baez, in her Fare Thee Well tour at the Green Music Center. We're not messing around here. Second prize is uh, a wine and artisan cheese tasting for four at Halleck Vineyards in Sebastopol. And third prize, which is no small potatoes either, is dinner for two at Lagar Restaurant in Santa Rosa. Again, not bad, right? So here's how it works. All new students get $20 uh, off their first six-week class, and all of the returning members who refer them get a $20 Wolfbuck card for each new student that you refer. And that card is good for dining services and bookstore purchases here on campus. So fill out the Bring a Buddy form. We have lots of them printed, so as many as you need, one for each new student, and return those to Ollie staff or volunteers, and we will announce the winners in our Gray Matters newsletter in the middle of October. So I'm hearing your mental Rolodexes 
combing through already. How many of you would like to see Joan Baez? Uh-huh, me too. All right, good luck with the contest. So to today's program, as many of you know, each of our instructors will have five minutes to dazzle you with their presentations as they give you a little taste of what their courses will be about this fall. I will be on the sidelines gently or not so gently, depending, uh, keeping time and letting them know when their time is up. So if you see me looking at my phone, I'm not surfing the internet over here. When everybody has presented, we'll have a bit of time back in the lobby for you to talk to them one-on-one -on -one and to register for classes. And we're going roughly in the order of the catalog. We've had a couple of accommodations for schedules. So if you all have an agenda, you'll be able to follow along just fine. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a sampler platter of all that Ollie has to offer. You will see on the agenda that our first speaker is Pete Elman. I am not Pete Elman. Pete Elman is in Cape Cod, which doesn't sound like a bad place to be. Um, he created a short video for you, which unfortunately, we're getting the glitches out of the way in the first five minutes, is not playing because it's embedded in a program that is, this is all above my head. But what I do have are slides for you from Pete, and I want to know first, how many of you have taken a class from Pete Elman? Okay, how many of you, leave your hands up if you would take another class from Pete Elman? Okay, so Pete is going to be teaching a class that I would like to take very much on singer-songwriters. It's all about the song. I remember his first class with Ollie, he had several people dancing in the aisles. I assume when Chuck Berry comes on, that will happen again. You know who you are. Buddy Holly, how could we talk about music without Buddy Holly? favorite, Carol King. How many of you own this album? Brian Wilson. Some guy named Paul Simon. Joni Mitchell, I'm sorry, I'll slow down, I promise. More Joni Mitchell. and Pete Elman. <laughs> so I hope that you will join Pete. Those of you who've taken his classes know that he will indeed have you dancing in the aisles. And uh, he's a wonderful instructor and a wonderful musician. I'm sorry he couldn't be here today. He plays several instruments. He will bring them to class. You will be uh, thoroughly entertained. So um, now that we've gotten that out of the way, I'm gonna welcome a real live human being to the stage. Uh, our first speaker today is Martin Marshall, who uh, is presenting another entertaining, upbeat class uh, in the arts for Ollie. This Monday will be our arts day, and he has a number of offerings that he proposed to us, but we took a vote, and we decided that Saturday Night Live, the Gilda Radner years, would appeal to many of you. So I give you Martin Marshall.
How many of you people recognize this guy? <laughs> Mr. Bill. Good. Well, you can make a Monday of it then. I'll be there in the morning. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll be there in the morning, and Pete will be there in the afternoon. Um, this will be the first time I've taught at Sonoma State, uh, the 24th time that I've taught comedy at Ollie, the fourth time through with Saturday Night Live. Um, let me make this up. Okay. So um, we're going to be, I'm going to be Monday morning, 9.30 to uh, 11.30 in the Cooperage. And uh, I've been teaching a series uh, of, of comedies of which one installment is the Saturday Night Live group. There's this. Hello. I am the luckiest, cockiest, ever, the bad, 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 bad in the world, world, world. Okay. Um, so, uh, with the glasses off, uh, we're doing clips. Uh, I've, I've edited about 180 hours of, of uh, those first five years uh, down, along with 24 films, um, into about 150 clips and uh, encased four books worth of uh, Saturday Night Live specific information into this cranium, which I will then spill out uh, to the assemblages. And uh, we'll do clips, we'll do the comedic te technique analysis, you'll learn what a mond green is. Um, uh, and we'll talk about the context of the times because uh, particularly political satire is relevant to the time in which it's created. And uh, we'll have some class interaction, although we are uh, creating this sausage from this huge amount of material uh, into this compacted uh, 12 hours that'll be in there. So, who needs comedy? Believe it or not, not all Ollies even believe that comedy is something that should be on their program. But uh, there's a guy in India named Dr. Madan Kataria that would disagree with them because he would tell you that comedy and the act of laughing generates dopamine, the, the brain releases dopamine to the body. And he did a study showing that uh, dopamine has a particular effect in seniors. It, ha it results in a better sex life, better memory, better sleep, greater enjoyment of life, more vigor, and did I mention a better sex life? Okay. So, here's the effect that it has. This <laughs> is your average American. This is your average American on comedy. Self-explanatory. So what are we gonna do in those six weeks? We're gonna do two weeks of Gilda, one week of Dan Aykroyd, one week of John Belushi, uh, one week of Bill Murray, and one week of everybody else. And uh, the, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I thought maybe I'd have one of those laser pointy things. Oh, no. Is it a pointy thingy? Oh no. Oh well. Imagine that my finger is a laser pointy thingy. And we've got Emily Latella, Roseanne Rosanna Dana, Judy Miller, Lisa Lupner, Baba Wawa, and Candy Slice, and I didn't even have room for Rhonda and the Rondettes um, on, on that slide. Uh, then we'll go to Dan Aykroyd, and we'll take a look at the pitch man, at the Fenstruck brothers, at Dan Aykroyd, station manager, at his wonderful, uh, memorable Julia Child uh, imitation, at uh, Beldar Conehead, uh, then Dan Aykroyd as Richard Nixon, Dan Aykroyd as Jimmy Carter, Dan Aykroyd as Elwood Blues, and of course, the Ghostbuster. Then we move along to Belushi, and you can see that, uh, I don't know if it's uh, uh, the, the lighting, but he's a killer bee in the first one. He's Joe Cocker in the second one. He's Vito Corleone in the third one. He's Beethoven in the fourth one. He's Jake Blues in the fifth one, and he's himself as the old man that he never got to be in, uh, in the sixth one, in a wonderful bit called uh, Don't Look Back in Anger. 
And then we'll go on to Bill Murray. Uh, Bill Murray, the lounge, Nick the Lounge Singer. If you've never seen Nick the Lounge Singer, uh, there actually was a real Nick the Lounge Singer that Bill Murray used to stalk at his, uh, <laughs> at his various, just taking notes on what the guy was like and then uh, replicating him. Uh, then there was, uh, of course, Pod, the other nerd, and in uh, the Ruttles, which the Saturday Night Live group was a part of, which was actually generated by Eric Idle and the Python group, um, uh, he played Murray the Bill Murray the K, uh, a takeoff on the actual Murray the K, who was the rock and roll uh, crazy guy who would play nothing but Beatles uh, when the Beatles were coming to New York the first time. And then finally, uh, who could forget Bill Murray's Oscar predictions, <laughs> which was like, I didn't see that one, I didn't see that one, I didn't see that one. Okay, and then we get to every six week, everybody else, and of course you're gonna see a lot of other people along the way, but uh, Chevy Chase as a land shark, the uh, incredible Andy Kaufman, um, uh, Steve Martin who hosted like eight times uh, here as King Tut, and then Garrett Morris in Prison Follies and Don Novello as uh, Father Guido Sarducci. And of course, the resident star, Mr. Bill. <laughs> okay, and while we're at it, we're gonna get a little bit, a couple of monologues from hosts like Richard Pryor was there uh, one week and, and tore up the place. Um, and Steve Martin had a couple of, of uh, host monologues that were pretty good, but um, uh, how much time we got left? Pretty much there? Okay. Uh, is there anybody up here you don't already recognize? Okay. That's just a sampling. What I've done is I've put together musical collages, and here's your collage of season one, season two, season three. As we go week to week, we get this treat of the medleys of the incredible musicians of that time that will be part of the SNL presentation. Thank you. I thought I might leave Mr. Bill up here to MC instead. Um, he might do a better job. Um, okay, moving on from that to, we're gonna skip around in the schedule, but it's this, it is reflected on your uh, agenda. We're gonna bring up Nicole Myers, one of our natural science instructors who also teaches here at Sonoma State. And I'd like to mention that this class is generously sponsored by Phil and Gail Brownell, who are here somewhere. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the way that that worked is uh, Phil and Gail had an idea for a class. And they said, if you can find somebody good to teach it, we'd like to sponsor it. Some other people in the audience have done that in the past. I remember Connie saw art in the caves of Lascaux and came back and said she'd like a class on Paleolithic art, and we had an archaeologist who could teach that. So that is an opportunity that's available to you. If you're interested in sponsoring a class, let me know, and uh, there are many benefits. In addition to getting your name uh, touted at this lovely event, you get three classes for the term that the class you're sponsoring is offered in. So. Um, more about that later. So our Natural Science Day, Thursdays, Nicole Myers. Good morning. I'm going to stand in my level. Somebody said teach natural disasters. I'm like, me, me, that's me. I want to teach that. <laughs> this is what I love to do. So this semester I will be teaching a series of lectures entitled Catastrophism, How Natural Disasters Have Affected Earth in Human Evolution. So imagine you are an alien species on a distant planet and you hear an advertisement for the best vacation spot. You should go to planet Earth. It has a little bit of everything. There's ice worlds, there's deserts, there's tropics, there's beaches, any temperature you want, but this is an active world. There will be natural disasters, so choose carefully where you choose to go. Some areas marked in red have a little bit higher chance of these disasters. Others marked in blue, quite a bit lower chance. But you're going to have to choose carefully because the temperature difference between the core and the surface of the planet lead to geological disasters. And the temperature difference from the equator to the poles leads to meteorological disasters. 
a great place to vacation, and in recent times, it's been relatively calm. So this is good timing to go to planet Earth. Because any number of disasters might happen, you need to know where you're going and be prepared. But we do need to consider that planet Earth has essentially been formed by a whole series of disasters that have occurred over the last four and a half billion years. In fact, the planet itself actually formed in a catastrophic series of natural disasters that is far beyond our capacity to imagine. For the first 750,000 million years of this planet's existence, it was literally a giant magma ball. Nothing but lava, nothing to land upon, with billions upon billions of space rocks falling to the surface of the planet on an ongoing bombardment. But as soon as things calm down, we see the first evidence of life on Earth. But it has not been the easiest ride for life on Earth. There have been many mass extinctions. On the bottom right, there's a graph showing just the last half billion years of Earth time. And the red line shows how life has continued to diversify despite natural disasters. Every single dip you see, that's a mass extinction that definitely decimated some portion of life on Earth. The blue line shows you extinction rate, and there's no such thing as zero extinction rate, but every peak marks some series of natural disasters that made it that much harder to live. But notice the very end, all the way to the right. It's been pretty calm for a while. It's been actually a pretty good time to visit planet Earth if you're an alien from elsewhere. I have a feeling this is not technical difficulties. Imagine an image of Mount St. Helens erupting. In the 1600s, the theory of catastrophism was essentially coined from biblical influence. The thought was that the Earth as we know it today, from a human perspective, formed almost entirely from catastrophic events. This, of course, was based on the premise of a 6,000-year-old Earth. So, yeah, they quite literally thought that the entire surface of the Earth could only be explained by catastrophic events. In the 1700s, James Hutton started to use his powers of observation. Imagine on the lower screen, you see a stream eroding out its banks. Very slowly, we can see how the surface of the Earth changes as a result of very small, everyday events that you and I consider relatively benign. For several hundred years, scientists argued which one was the dominant way that the Earth's surface changed. Well, it turns out everyone was right and everyone was wrong. The Earth changes by both extremes, both on a catastrophic level, but also on a very constant day-to-day -day level. And so humans have found a way to track all of our natural disasters, because of course we are most interested in trying to survive on planet Earth. We have tracked natural disasters by looking at the numbers. The top left graph is literally showing the recorded natural disasters globally. There's really not that level of increase of natural disasters. We just are getting better at recording on a global level. On the top right, we record sometimes by lives lost as a result of natural disasters. Bottom right, looking at the financial losses as a result of natural disasters. And bottom left, looking at statistical probability of certain disasters occurring in certain locations because where you live matters. There's no safe place on Earth but you get to choose which natural disasters you are more willing to <laughs> deal with on a statistical level. I'll take the earthquakes over the hurricanes any day, personally. And when we look at how humans have dealt with natural disasters, we tend to think that, oh, that was a huge blow to the human population. Even the top four deadliest natural disasters, ranging from half a million to several million people losing their lives, not even a blip on the human population. In fact, when we look back in time, the only time we actually see a significant dip in the human population was during the Black Death and epidemic. About 70,000 years ago, a major catastrophic uh, volcanic eruption in Indonesia probably brought the human population to less than 10,000 people. We know for a fact it was less than 10,000 breeding pairs of people, maybe as few as only 1,000. And previous to that, 150,000 years ago, Ice Age desertification changed the surface of Africa, making it very difficult for our ancestors to survive. 
Some geneticists think there are only 600 people living. Since then, things have just gotten better and better for the human race. And each one of these natural disasters we experience, as sad and as devastating as they are, they have not affected the human population in the way we think. We are survivors. We know how to make it on this planet. So this semester, I will be focusing each week on different kind of natural disasters, starting with volcanic eruptions and then earthquakes. So I'll talk about landslides. I'll talk about tsunamis. Yeah, that laser pointer would be awesome. Um, <laughs> I will talk about the history of the, each of these events, like when has the most, when have the deadliest, most destructive events occurred in the past? Where do we expect them to occur in the future? And more importantly than anything else, how do you survive one if you have the misfortune of experiencing one? There will be a special focus on the probability of local earthquakes. What should we expect? We live in earthquake country. What should we expect for our future and how should we prepare? Because when it happens, if you know what to do, then your chances are that much better. I will also focus on meteorological natural disasters like typhoons and hurricanes, tropical storms, extreme winter storms. We'll look at droughts, the fires that are associated with them, keeping in mind that I will be sensitive, knowing that last year was not an easy year for the vast majority of us here. But we're also looking at how these, mat these meteorological natural disasters seem to increase in intensity and in number as a result of global warming. We want to be able to understand if that trend is actually occurring or if it's just our perception. Because we know that if we have an increase in meteorological natural disasters, then we expect the human population to have to migrate, am I out of time? To have to migrate, to actually be able to move. And when we have most of the human population on coastlines, waterways, and tectonic boundaries, where these disasters are most likely to occur, and therefore they are inevitable, we want to know where humans will be moving in the future. Because we live on a rock, moving around the sun. We don't have anywhere else to go, except elsewhere on this planet. So join me this semester for six weeks on Thursdays at 1 o'clock for Catastrophism, how natural disasters have affected Earth and human evolution, and more importantly, how we survive these disasters and go on to live in a world that's ever evolving. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. OK, so moving on to somebody who is probably uh, not a stranger to most of you. How many of you have taken a class from Mick Chandler? Let me ask this another way. How many of you have not taken a class from Mick Chandler? OK. Um, this gentleman has been a big part of the OLLI program uh, for as long as I've been here and many years before that. He is currently the chair of our advisory board. He's on our curriculum committee. I used to say he could teach the phone book and you would come, but that got boring. And then I substituted the Sears and Roebuck catalog, but that got boring and I'm running out of things to say. So I will just bring him to the stage, Mr. Mick Chandler. Good morning, everyone. This fall, I'll be teaching a class entitled The Rehabilitation of Ulysses S. Grant. And it is largely based on the work that you see on the screen on your right, uh, Ron Chernow's latest masterpiece. Ron Chernow, for those of you who are not familiar with him, is a contemporary writer, a biographer. And when Ron Chernow publishes a book, it makes big news in the world of readers. A few years ago, he published his mammoth biography of Alexander Hamilton, which became not only a bestseller, but served as the springboard for Lynn Miranda's great Broadway hit, uh, Hamilton, uh, an unlikely hip-hop version of the Founding Fathers. Uh, but it certainly made a big, big splash on Broadway and now around the rest of the country. Uh, and has brought a number of young people into the discipline of history. So I feel uh, anything that, that gets youngsters to read about our past is, is more than justifiable. Uh, in his latest book, Ron poses a paradox for us to consider. Ulysses S. Grant, for over a century, has been essentially dissed by both professional historians and the public at large 
the standard interpretation of Grant for, for most of the 20th century was that as a military leader, he was a, quote, butcher because of his massive casualty rates during the campaigns that he organized during the Civil War. And in politics, he's written off as the most corrupt president that we've ever had. Most historians during the 20th century placed him at the very bottom of the list when historians are called upon to rank uh, the effectiveness and the, uh, the efficacy of our, of our chief executives throughout our history. Grant almost invariably came in either last or next to last if they put James Buchanan at the bottom of the list. Chernow asks us to ponder this question. How is it that a man who essentially, more than any other single military figure during the Civil War, allowed the, the nation to survive? Uh, why is it that a man who piloted the Union armies to 17 victories in battles during the Civil War, a man who captured three rebel armies during the war, including Robert E. Lee's vaunted Army of Northern Virginia, how is it that this man is considered a bum? How is it that a person who, because of his influence, his stature, his prestige, and his power, being general in chief of the army, managed to keep the country on a stable path and, and enabled it to survive during the rocky years of reconstruction after the war terminated in 1865, there was no guarantee that the nation was going to continue to exist even after the shooting stopped at Appomattox. And it was largely Grant's power that enabled America to make it past this most severe crisis, I would argue, of our nation's history. How is it that this person is, is dismissed or has been dismissed as being ineffective, corrupt, and essentially uh, inferior to, to every other 19th and 20th century president? It's a puzzling paradox. And one of the purposes of the course will be to untie this riddle and try to explain why someone of, of his accomplishments does not or has not until recently received the credit that he has coming to him. And Chernow, along with a number of other contemporary historians, is attempting to write the record. So we will proceed, as always, with a, a six-week chapter-by-chapter inquiry into our subject matter. <coughs> Week one is entitled uh, America in the Age of Grant. Grant was born in 1822 and died in 1885. And those 65 years, approximately, encompass a period of amazing change and growth in America. We go from essentially a very relatively primitive and immature political structure the year he is born. And by the time he dies, uh, we have become a full-blown world power. Now, I'm not saying he is the, the driving force behind those transformations, but he certainly played a significant role. And in week one, we'll try to place his career in the context of the major social, political, and economic trends uh, of his lifetime. Week two will look upon his early years. Grant is a fascinating character for a number of reasons, not the least of which he would be probably the least likely to succeed, you might say, um, if you looked at him at midlife. Uh, in 1858 and 1859, Grant was reduced to selling firewood on the streets of St. Louis in order to be able to take care of his family. Uh, he, in, in 1858, he had to hawk his West Point watch uh, to a pawnbroker in St. Louis so that he could buy his children Christmas presents. Within three years, he's probably the best known figure in America with the exception of Abraham Lincoln. So it's this kind of rags to, if not riches, at least fame and success story that makes him kind of a paradig paradigmatic American hero. Uh, in week three and four, we're going to be looking at Lee, his 
competition on the battlefield as well as in the minds of Americans with his great antagonist, Robert E. Lee. It's, it's one of the, the strange paradoxes of history that Grant was relegated to, quote, loser status, while Robert E. Lee, who in fact did lose the war for the Confederacy, became a national hero. How did that come to pass? We'll, we'll try to explain the, the cultural and social reasons why Lee, for a long time, was elevated above Grant in the national pantheon. That's not true any longer. We're going to look in week five at Grant's views on race and how his attitudes toward race colored his views toward Reconstruction and how to put the country back together again after the war. And we'll see that Ulysses S. Grant, for a man of the mid-19th century, had probably the least amount of racial prejudice and bigotry in his thinking than any other national figure of his time. And that would include Abraham Lincoln, by the way. Grant's views on black people are remarkably advanced and progressive. I, I think Grant would feel very comfortable in today's political environment. Uh, I think he would probably would have been someone who would have worked for civil rights during the 1960s and 70s. We'll also be taking a look at Grant's enlightened views on Native Americans. He was a person unlike most military men of his time. He did not feel that the only good Indian was a dead Indian, and he did what he could as president to try to bring at least a measure of justice uh, and, and reconciliation with the Indian tribes of the West. He failed, but I, I wouldn't say that was his fault. He did his level best to try to change Indian policy. It was impossible, but he tried. And then in the last week of the course, we'll be looking at his presidency, which admittedly has a checkered history. There are high points and low points, but certainly it would not be fair to say that he was the worst or one of the worst presidents that we've ever had. So I hope you'll join me uh, for this exploration of not only Ulysses S. Grant, but 19th century American racial culture uh, in our class on Tuesdays at the Cooper Age. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to move on, and we get a two-for-one deal this time. Um, we have a class that is actually being taught by three people, two of whom are here today. One of them is a returning OLLI instructor of some renown, and the other is new to the OLLI program. Um, Dave McEwen, how many of you have taken a class from Dave? Many of you. Okay, Dave has been with OLLI for a while and is a political science faculty here at Sonoma State. Um, his colleague who is with him here today is Paul Gullickson, who joined the staff at Sonoma State uh, how many months ago? Five months ago. That was going to be my guess. Five months ago, coming to us most recently, <coughs> excuse me, from the Press Democrat. And he is now um, our uh, VP of Strategic Communications for Sonoma State University, and he and Dave and one other instructor who couldn't be here today, but you will hear about, are going to co-teach this class on a rather topical issue, fake news. So I give you Dave McEwen and Paul Gullickson. Good morning. Um, thank you for, for being here. This is my first chance to actually teach, but I have great respect, and there's so many of these classes I want to take, including Ulysses S. Grant, which I'm reading the book right now, but um, I'm reading like six books right now, so I'm going to get back to that one now. Anyway, I, I, um, my name is Paul Gullickson. I, I want to tell you a story. Last week, uh, I had a friend of mine, a, a um, a professional and a journalist, somebody I've known for 30 years, and he posted a, a story on his Facebook page. And it was about a man from, a uh, 26-year-old man from Bartlesville, Oklahoma, who was so upset about the new uh, campaign uh, with Nike featuring Colin Kaepernick. 
that he went out in his garage, took his Nike sneakers, soaked them in kerosene, and burned them. And in the process, burned his garage down and his entire house. <laughs> now, I had the same reaction you just did, but I, 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 I replied to my friend just simply, Michael, this cannot be true. And he responded to me right away saying, I know I didn't believe it myself, but I went to the website. This is a US, it was in the USA today, and it is very much a true story. Well, the next day, um, my friend Michael was eating crow and issuing apologies because, in fact, the story was fake. The website, in fact, that he went to was fake as well. Somebody had gone to great extremes to push this uh, bogus story. <coughs> now, I will say we all know fake news is an incendiary term. And um, I'm not sure, I'll be honest, I, that I agree with how our president uses it um, and, and, and his, uh, how he applies it in his uh, dialogue. But it is very much a real thing. That may sound like an oxymoron, but fake news is real. It impacts all of us, and it is influencing our lives, and it is influencing our politics. In the class, Dave and I are going to, and Richard Hertz and I are going to be teaching fake news, real news, and the midterm elections. We are going to start off in weeks one and two. We're going to be looking at the definition of fake news. What, how do we spot it? How is it influencing our lives? How is it, um, where do we see it? And um, we're going to be checking, we're going to be offering ideas of how to be checking our information. What is good information and what do we do about it when we, when we see it? Um, we're going to be looking at case studies of how it has had some of the damaging effects fake news has, has had. And we're going to be looking also at um, how it potentially influ may be influencing our midterm elections as they approach. And um, we're also going to be looking at how newsrooms are handling this, this phenomena. What's going on internally in our newsrooms? How are they handling it, uh, particularly in an era where the president is referring to new, the press as the enemy of the people um, and the prolifera proliferation of uh, fake news in our news media? The objective is really to help um, all of us make sure we are spreading the right information and engaging in debates, whether in public or on social media and other platforms, without losing our credibility and our friends. Um, we hope you'll enjoy us. Uh, you'll join us for this discussion. I also want to. Um, I'm going to let Dave uh, speak, but there is one more bonus feature that we're offering. KRCB. Nancy Dobbs from KRCB has called and they want to do a live um, a panel discussion about this subject, which is we're going to be featuring. Um, it will be on, I believe it's the date is October 15th. That's a Monday. We're hoping to book that at the Cooperage. We'll be sending you more information as, as that comes out. But they're going to be doing a live broadcast a panel discussion about that very issue, and that will be just uh, three weeks before the election. Now I'll let you um, uh, hear from Dave. Uh, thank you all. Uh, good morning. So we have uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We have catastrophes. We have comedy. We have a mischaracterized president. We have politics and the midterm elections. So uh, we, the three of us, we have a former newspaper guy. You have a political scientist who studies campaigns and elections and terrorism, maybe the same thing. Uh, and then you also have uh, a, a pollster. And so you have the opportunity in this class where we're each going to spend two sections. We'll each do two weeks at a time, and then we'll culminate at the end, right before the midterm election, with what we think will be happening. We can capture the dynamics. You're going to learn a lot about not only fake news, but Richard Hertz, our colleague who's a pollster, we also track money in politics. So we're going to learn a lot about dark money and how money moves, uh, the different tricks that we used in politics and what's happening now uh, with that and how it, the game has changed, how that gets characterized or not by the news, and in the context of all of this, what's happening in the Twitterverse every morning. Uh, he's tweeted uh, three times this morning. He was silent for two days. Uh, so we'll be tracking this uh, during the whole aspect of the Mueller investigation and everything that is changing moment by moment. So you have the opportunity in this class to really wrap it all together based upon all the other classes. And if it doesn't work, most of the time, our classes tend to be depressing, but you can always go to catastrophes. Uh, <laughs> and... 
and in that process, our class will be uplifting. So please join us as well. Thank you all very much. Or you can watch Saturday Night Live when you're done with that class, one or the other. All right. Moving on, I would like to introduce somebody who is new to the OLLI faculty and who comes to us most recently from Stanford, I believe. That was a while ago. Okay, less recently from Stanford. Um, and while she is more of a historian by training, uh, the timeliness of her topic in light of the Me Too movement and other things happening politically, I would say makes an interesting segue from our last presentation. She's going to talk about three waves of women in resistance in historical context. Please join me in welcoming Amy Elizabeth Robinson. Good morning. So we have all those things that Dave just mentioned, and now we have women. <laughs> so I am a historian, and I'm a writer, and I'm a parent. And this class was very unabashedly inspired by this. This is my nine-year-old, then nine-year-old daughter with me at the Women's March in D.C. in January 2017. She got to see D.C. for the first time like this, and we haven't been back since. But it also was inspired by posters like this at the Women's March. I'll see you nice white ladies at the next Black Lives Matter March, right? This was actually carried in L.A. by a South Asian American man and also by images like this. This is the same day, the Women's March in India, where their hashtag was, I will go out, where they were going out just to claim the right to go out, which is feminism in a different, a related, but a different valence and context. And I was fascinated that day by the range of images and the range of, the range of claims that women were making in the streets. And it also is inspired by this. This is the Golden Globes Time's Up protest, not just the Me Too protest, but the Time's Up protest, which is a little bit different earlier this year. So we have Meryl Streep uh, with Ai-jen Poo, head of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, Michelle Williams with Tarana Burke, who is the founder of the Me Too movement, which was intended originally for young uh, women of color, and Amy Poehler with Saru Jayaraman, who is an attorney and an advocate for immigrant restaurant workers. So this is a class about historicizing this current moment that we're in. And it's not just for women, because who wouldn't want to understand the deep structures underlying this current moment and who hasn't noticed what's going on this year and the, the last few years in terms of women's leadership and protest. And it's not just about the unity that we saw on the streets that day, January um, 2017, but also about the disjunctures and the silences and how to understand those and how, th how they can help us move forward. And in order to do that, we have to make some lateral moves. So this class is not just a chronological class from 1848 to 2018, but we'll be stopping at moments and making some lateral moves into places that have been less visible in the narrative of women's history. So in a conventional class in the lineage of women's movements, you might start with Abigail Adams asking her husband to remember the ladies in his work. And then you might move on to Mary Wollstonecraft, author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women in the late 18th century. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who were close friends and early and very persistent suffragists. Probably, maybe you'd get Sojourner Truth saying, aren't I a woman, putting the question of race and gender right on the table in the mid-19th century in a really radical way. And um, so you might get her in this narrative. And then later in the 19th century, Carrie Chapman Catt, another suffragist and founder of the League of Women Voters, uh, once women got the right to vote. And you'd get to the victory of suffrage. And then moving into the 
war-torn and questioning 20th century, you might get Virginia Woolf getting a room of her own. Simone de Beauvoir, author of The Second Sex. Betty Friedan, founder of the National Organization of Women, author of The Feminine Mystique. So I'll stop there, because I have five minutes. That's the second wave of the three waves in the conventional narrative of women's movements. Um, you may have noticed something that most of these women shared, which is the color of their skin, and for the most part, their class. So when I describe this class to people and they ask, you know, what I'm doing this fall, I say that I'm teaching a history of feminism as it has been inflected by race, class, and internationalism. So we're not just sharing the platform, we're also widening the platform to understand feminism in a new way. So we'll look at the waves of women's movements and we'll be making some moves. So when we remember the ladies, we'll also be remembering that the word lady has always carried a freight of race and whiteness from restrooms to rail cars to novels and on and on. When we consider Mary Wollstonecraft and the revolutionary, revolutionary era, we'll, we also will consider Flora Tristan, um, who I just discovered in the last few years and I adore. She was a French Peruvian author who worked for women's rights. Um, she wrote, her first pamphlet was on women in public places and also wrote against um, slavery. She had gone to, she traveled to Peru from France and um, included this long dialogue with a slave owner in one of her works, which was really radical. And she also was an organizer of the working class, the urban working class and rural working class in France. We don't know a lot about her. When we talk about the victory of suffrage, we'll also be talking about its silences, particularly around the challenges faced by women of color. So this is Ida Wells Barnett, who was asked to march at the back of the suffrage parade by Carrie Chapman Catt. And this is both the visual and the verbal language of the suffrage triumph. These were the images that were dominant. So we'll be looking at these. And then we might turn and consider someone like Sophia Dulip Singh, who was an Indian suffragette who organized and marched alongside Emmeline Pankhurst in Britain, who not many people know about. So what might she have felt about the silences around the suffrage victory and the language of the suffrage, suffrage victory? When we consider Virginia Woolf, we will also consider her good friend Margaret Llewellyn Davies who was the founder of the Working Class Women's Cooperative Guild. And this is a book that she put together of working women's voices in early 20th century Britain that had an introduction by Virginia Woolf. But the voices in the book were the women themselves. When we consider Simone de Beauvoir, we will also consider her work alongside a Tunisian lawyer, Giselle Halimi, on behalf of Jamila Bupacha, who was an Algerian woman tortured by the French military during the Algerian War for Independence. So de Beauvoir was not just the author of The Second Sex. She was also widening her platform very actively to include women of color. And when we consider Betty Friedan, we will also consider Polly Murray, who is the co-founder of the National Organization of Women. She was a friend of Eleanor Roosevelt's first African-American female Episcopal priest, lawyer, activist, poet, and human rights champion. So these are just a few examples of the sideways moves that we'll make out of the conventional narrative. So we'll not just be remembering the ladies and asking what about the women, we'll be asking which women, and in what directions can we move today from this moment, and what does it mean to be a next-gen suffragette, like my daughter's sign in the beginning of the presentation. So I hope you join me on Wednesday mornings for six weeks, and I hope to see you there. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Okay, so now we're gonna bring up something that's not depressing at all, and not a social issue, but more about beauty and aesthetics. Um, someone who is new to our faculty as well, 
Charlie uh, Goldberg has been a docent at SF MoMA for many years, and I think we discovered we didn't quite, quite cross paths. I worked there in 01, so we missed each other by a year or so, but he's been there for quite some time, and he has a wonderful photographic history course using the collection of SF MoMA. So I'm really excited to add this to our roster and to welcome him to the stage, Charlie Goldberg. Hello. So uh, I'm a first time Ollie speaker and it's very exciting for me because my parents were both lifelong learners. My mom, they were both depression era kids and didn't really get to go to college and my mom got her degree when she was in her 60s. She continued to attend class till she was 90 years old and then had a car accident which kind of put an end to her being able to travel. My dad got his degree, his, his bachelor's at 87, two weeks before he died. So I, I have to say, you know, uh, I, I'm so happy to be teaching uh, in a situation like this. I think my parents would be really, really happy to see me up here. So uh, my course is going to be Wednesdays, uh, 1 to 3, and we're going to be talking about photography. And I want to give a disclaimer. If you're thinking about this course as someone who is a photographer and are going to try to learn different techniques and try to improve improve your means of taking photographs, it's not the course for you. I'm a guide, I'm a docent at a museum, so what I do is I look at these photographs as essentially works of art. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at why we're looking at them, why are they interesting to us, you know, what were the photographers thinking when they were doing these, these works. And we're going to start with this. This is the first known photograph ever taken. So I think we'd be hard pressed to really call this art. It's really more science. But we're going to look at why this was so important, what came right before it, and why we continue to look at this with wonder and amazement, at least I do. And an important side portion of the course is you'll get to hear how to pronounce that name, which I'm not going <laughs> to tell you today. So we'll be looking at, at, at photographs like this. Clearly, the photographer here, again, I'm not going to pronounce this name for you until the course, but clearly this photographer here is looking at photography as an art. You can see how he's using shadow play, how he's forming the entire picture. So we'll, we'll be looking at lots of works like this. We'll also look at what sort of techniques photographers use to make us more interested in what the subject is that they're trying to capture. So for example, here's an example of a worm's eye view where the photographer clearly had their lens below the subject and to show sort of an opposite opinion, this is the bird's eye view where you can clearly see where this photographer has looked down onto the subject and you can see how that gives us a really different impression of what we're looking at by using those different techniques. <coughs> oh, not yet. We'll also look at composition. This is Henri Cartier-Bresson, who's arguably one of the greatest photographers who ever lived. This is actually a photograph that, that SF Momo owns, and we'll look at why he was so important. He's someone who came up with the term the decisive moment. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. But the idea is when do you capture that precise moment when a, when a picture will really make sense to you? And a really good example is this, timing. I don't know if you know who that is, that's Salvador Dali. And this is just a wonderful, just exuberant photograph. And we'll talk a lot about this and how important the timing of, of, of a photograph is. We'll talk about experimentation. You can see how this particular photograph, a photographer is using different techniques to give us a different mood, to give us a different sense of what's going on in this particular photograph. And then we're just going to have lots of fun. We're going to look at lots of interesting different photographs. We're not necessarily going to get technical or artistic when we're talking about photographs all the time. We're going to see what captures our imagination, what captures the imagination of a society. Why do we, you know, look at at photographs in National Geographic or Look or Life magazine. They're not necessarily of important issues that have a lot of gravitas. Sometimes they just capture a slice of life that are so wonderful, just like that. And uh, included in this course,
course, will be a field trip to SF Momo, where I will be your, your guide. We're going to be having a, uh, a show of both Brassai and Louis Stettner. And I think that that'll be a really fun way to end up the course. We'll be able to actually be in the museum and look at these pictures really up close. And it really makes a big difference. I often travel, when I, do, when I do these tours, I often travel with a large magnifying glass. And I invite people to really get up close and see things that you might not otherwise have seen. Especially when you have to reproduce them on a large scale like this, you lose some of the clarity of the photographs. So we'll be able to do that. <coughs> and then, if you have any questions or uh, have any ideas about the course and what you're expecting, this is just, again, just a fun picture. Okay? Good. I hope to see you on Wednesday afternoon. Okay. So now uh, we're returning to science. We went a little bit out of order earlier uh, to accommodate a schedule of Nicole and her teaching. But now I welcome uh, someone who has taught several courses for Ollie at multiple sites here in Sonoma County. And he's become a friend of the program. And he travels quite a bit. And I was delighted that he was going to be around for these particular six weeks to come back this fall with a new course on global warming, not just an inconvenient truth. Please join me in welcoming Warren Wiscombe. Thank you for coming, everyone. Um, some natural disasters unroll slowly. Uh, some unroll rapidly, like tsunamis. So uh, Thursday is disaster day. And my course is going to talk about disa a disaster that will unroll slowly over the course of decades. And we're going to try to parse out truth from fiction and take a look at this subject, which you see articles about in the newspaper almost weekly, if not daily. So uh, I'm a scientist. I spent my whole career in the area of climate science. Uh, essentially orbiting around the subject of global warming, which became a central paradigm for the whole subject. Um, and I worked at NASA for most of my career for National Center of Atmospheric Research, and uh, even in the very first large climate program, the ARPA program, believe it or not, funded by Department of Defense back in the early 1970s. So I've been there, I've seen it all, I've known most of the major players in climate science, and since I retired, I've assiduously avoided teaching global warming because, firstly, I taught quite a bit of it when I was still uh, actively employed at NASA. And secondly, it's kind of depressing, some aspects of it, about the human race, really. Uh, and thirdly, it, it, we thought we had settled most of the science and kicked it over the transom to the policy people, and now it's been kicked back. It's back in our laps again. So I want to take a look at the science of this subject and a lot of the uh, disinformation that's been told about the science. Uh, so I subtitled this Not Just an Inconvenient Truth because uh, I think this subject actually goes much deeper. It's a subject that uh, illustrates that humans have a hard time comprehending the idea that they're in charge of the earth in many ways. And this is an example of that. So it's more than just an inconvenient truth. Um, let's, I'm gonna start out with a subject that is, uh, you know, very relevant to this area, which is wildfire. Uh, it's a wonderful subject in the sense that it brings in many areas of climate science. Uh, and it shows how complex it is to unravel a subject and if possible to see the influence of global warming on that subject. So uh, that will be something I'll lead off with. Uh, I'll try to make the case that global warming is common in scientific sense. Uh, it's not just the fact that temperature's rising, that wouldn't prove anything. Uh, models have their flaws, so if it was only models telling us about it, then we would be right not to trust that information. But it's actually just common sense, because climate, I'm going to uh, tell you, is at root a rather simple war between uh, the forces of uh, global warming, which are greenhouse gases, uh, reflection, which 
is accomplished by clouds and so forth, reflecting sunlight back to space, and the sun, which does vary slightly, and the sun's orbit changes slightly over long periods of time, like thousands and tens of thousands of years. So climate can be understood uh, in a commonsensical way. It isn't something that you have to trust things that perhaps are not entirely trustable. So I'll first begin with the history. Uh, by the end of the 1800s, we had a pretty good grasp of the essentials of global warming. Uh, the first person to measure the greenhouse effect of gases was this fellow John Tyndall uh, in 1859, and he measured the uh, essentially the absorptive power of water, carbon dioxide, methane, and many other gases. Uh, and he was the first to announce with great fanfare, actually, that uh, counter to what people believed at the time, these gases, which are transparent in the visible region and in the solar spectrum in general, are quite opaque in the infrared region. And of course, that's where the whole action of the greenhouse effect takes place. Then one more character we'll take a look at is Svante Arrhenius, a Nobel Prize winning physical chemist who took a detour uh, from his normal work to build the world's first climate model. And uh, he published a paper in 1896, which is still a landmark. It's still actually worth reading uh, about this subject. And we'll talk about that, what his results were, and so forth. Um, then we'll move on to the modern history of climate science, which more or less began in the 1950s. There were a lot of arguments. Some people said all the CO2 would go into the ocean so it's no big deal. Uh, this man, Charles Keeling, was sent to Antarctica in the International Geophysical Year to measure CO2, and very quickly uh, he published a paper within two and a half years showing that CO2 was rising, and Antarctica being a good place to measure CO2, you see it's just slowly rising, and it's continued to rise ever since then. We'll talk a bit about ice. You see Mountain glaciers, which you see a lot of news items about, really don't amount to all that much in terms of ice. They do amount to a lot in terms of water supply for certain regions of the globe, California included. So we'll talk a bit about mountain glaciers, but mainly about Greenland and Antarctica, where most of the ice is and where we're seeing a massive amount of melting right now. Uh, we'll also talk about Arctic sea ice, which is uh, really in a, a huge downward trend. This is the uh, Arctic sea ice minimum, which occurs usually in September. And you see it started out around 7 million square kilometers in area. And in 2012, it had an all-time low, around 3 million. Uh, it's bounced back a lo little since then, but the downward trend is pretty evident. And uh, that's, of course, from warming ocean water. Uh, in Antarctica, we had the collapse of the Larsen D ice shelf in 2002. Our best estimates is it's been there for since 12,000 years ago, if not longer. Um, this was a rather shocking event, took place over a matter of months, um, again due to warming ocean water. Um, then we'll talk a bit about uh, geoengineering, uh, various methods, some harebrained, to essentially modify the climate. The most logical one is actually to just mimic a volcano and have aircraft uh, if I can point at them, yeah. Aircraft spraying uh, sulfur compounds at high altitudes, which then get up to the stratosphere and reflect sunlight back to space. Another one of the more wacky ones is this cloud seeding, where you have automated boats traveling the world's oceans spraying seawater into the air, which will nucleate clouds, which will reflect sunlight back to space. So I'll talk about some of these methods, uh, the ones that I didn't just talk about. Uh, then we'll talk a bit about what paleoclimate has taught us about global warming. Probably the most iconic graph of that is this one. Uh, when we got the Vostok ice core back, it went back 400,000 years, Vostok's in Antarctica, uh, and we saw that methane at the bottom, temperature in the middle, and carbon dioxide at the top all varied together uh, in and out of ice ages. Uh, meaning that whether or not carbon dioxide and methane were feedbacks or forcing agents was irrelevant. They definitely are feedbacks. 
uh, and the temperature and CO2 just vary in lockstep. I'll show you an animated graph where that will be even more obvious to you. So, Then about the oceans. It turns out mm, air temperature is, is certainly not the best way to look at global warming. It's the ocean warming that really matters because whether it's 93.4 or not, I would question, but certainly over 90% of the warming uh, due to the greenhouse gases is going into the oceans. And we're only recently capable of measuring that with the Argo float system. So we'll look at Argo. And uh, we'll, this will also help explain the so-called global warming hiatus, which occurred starting in 1998 after the last big El Nino event. Andre, okay. So we'll, we'll finish by talking about climate denialism and the various tactics and techniques they use to deny climate change, including demonizing characters like Al Gore and putting up non-scientists or very suspicious scientists against uh, authentic scientists in so-called fake debates. And then we'll, we'll finish by talking about the, the sort of bad scientists, the guys who actually have been for sale to deny the influence of smoking on cancer <coughs> of ozone on the ozone layer, I mean, for fluorocarbons on the ozone layer, and who were at the forefront of denying global warming. So that's, uh, that's a kind of a tiptoe through the course, and I hope you'll join me on Thursdays, uh, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, so this is the point in the TV commercial where they say, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Just when you thought you've had enough. Um, we have, as I mentioned, a new series called Ollie Off Season, which will take place between the fall and winter terms, utilizing the beautiful new Wine Spectator Learning Center. How many of you have seen this building? A couple of you. It's a spectacular addition to the campus, and we are one of the only programs outside of the business school that is allowed to use it during the next academic year, and I had to give up, uh, I don't know what, to get the Friday slot that we got, but uh, I thank the dean for helping to lobby for that, and we will be presenting everything you want, always wanted to know about public and private finance, but were afraid to ask with somebody who is no stranger to Ollie and has taught courses for us on the Bay Area economy, I think an international economics course, and we're delighted to have him back to launch this new series, Mike Arnold. This is as dangerous. This guy. Okay, <coughs> this course is, like most of the courses I've taught here, relatively packed. And as you can see, we're going to start off talking about personal finance, which I'll, I'll show you a couple of slides in a second. We'll get into federal finance, which of course is so interesting these days because it's, despite the fact that a lot of people aren't covering it, I assume you all know the federal deficit is, is increasing very quickly uh, due to the tax cut. We'll then move to the Federal Reserve, which controls most of the finance on the planet and finally end up on a discussion regarding the financial system and why is it that since other courses are about disasters, how is it that financial systems explode? And when they do explode, they cause real pain to everybody. So in beginning with personal finance, the first thing to know about personal finance is the axiom system. The axiom system that underlies all finance. There are three axioms. More is preferred to less, now is preferred to later, and stable is preferred to unstable. You will find that those principles lead to virtually all the things you've ever heard about in terms of personal finance, discounting risk and return, insurance, price earnings ratios, diversification. We're going to cover all of these topics in the, first, uh, in the first couple of lectures. It's quite a lot. This is one of my favorite diagrams in finance. This is the diagram of stock market returns over a long period of time since World War II. This diagram to economic students is referred to as a mean reverting process. 
And what this means is why it is that stocks in the long run are a very good investment, but over the short run are highly risky. Just look at the variance of return in the short term, but look at the variance of returns over the long term. Now, I should tell you, when I taught this class uh, in the spring, in the middle of the class, the uh, Dow dropped 1,000 points. <laughs> and needless to say, the students were quite interested in, <laughs> in what the implications were. And I explained to them, as a matter of fact, you have learned nothing. You know nothing more today than you did the day before, other than the Dow has dropped 1,000 points. It means nothing for what happened afterwards, and luckily, Nothing major happened after that, and so I survived the class. <laughs> <laughs> this is a diagram. A lot of people think, for example, that markets tank in recessions. This is, you'll learn this diagram in the class in, ter in terms of the details as to what it shows. But what it really shows is no markets do adjust uh, after the economy hits its peak, but they don't typically tank with the exception of that red line over there in the right. The red line over there in the right is the decline in stock markets after the Federal Reserve decided not to allow Lehman to go bankrupt, and we will be talking about why the Federal Reserve decided to do that. There is a new book out called The Fed and Lehman Brothers, and what a professor at Johns Hopkins University documents is the Fed didn't do its homework. This is an example of what happens to uh, stock markets in the beginning of recovery. And what it shows is, yes, there's, there's a cycle to stock markets. They don't go down as much as you think they do when the economy begins to tank. But they do go up uh, when, when the economy is recovered. Now, why is that? We'll be talking about that. We'll then move on to federal finance. This is a diagram of what we're living in right now. The red is the increasing federal deficit. The blue is the increasing federal debt that we are incurring as a result of the tax cut from, from last year. And yes, it has had some stimulus. It's known as front-loading the economy. There are certain benefits right now, which a certain person is taking all the credit for. The reality is we're going to be paying for this uh, for, a, for a long time coming. And one of the things that makes it interesting is I do a little bit of international finance to explain the relationship between the federal deficit and the trade deficit. Now, we have a president of the United States that doesn't understand this diagram because it turns out that, that the overall balance of trade is largely right now being determined by the size of the federal deficit. So policies he's adopting are going to be increasing the trade deficit over time while he's out there negotiating very various agreements. And you'll realize why uh, there's a lot of irrationality going on, and we'll be talking about that. Then, given that I just turned 65, I figure the Social Security Trust Fund is something that is relevant to the students that take this course. And you, too, will learn the Social Security Trust Fund is not going bankrupt. In fact, the term bankruptcy to the Social Security Trust Fund is misinformation. It is not how that trust fund works, and we'll be talking about the economics and the finances of, the, of that system. And then, finally, looking at the diagram regarding the Federal Reserve and interest rates, the black line being an interest rate it controls very closely called the Fed funds rate, which is an overnight borrowing rate between banks and is the basis for how the Fed controls the economy versus the red line, which is, happens to do with long-term interest rates. And if you want to understand long-term interest rates, then it turns out you need to understand something that has occurred in this economy that most people don't realize, which is beginning in the mid-90s or so, the Fed adopted target rates for the inflation rate. And it has been wildly successful. There is no other macroeconomic policy that is occurring that has been this successful. And it is the basis for that, that in fact they're executing the controls over the economy. And it is why interest rates, because the inflation rate is now beginning to go up, it is why interest rates are in fact, go in fact going up. Alas, we have a financial system. And we have learned 
firsthand, financial systems can be very unstable. The real question is, this is not new information. <laughs> this is a list of various financial explosions and meltdowns that have gone back to the 1600s, beginning with the tulip crisis. And the fact is there are reasons financial systems that are inherently unstable and why it requires government regulation to regulate them, to keep them from becoming more unstable, and how that led to what the weak regulation and oversight of this financial system ended up blowing it up. There's no question about it. It was man-made, man-caused, and it can be pre prevented in the future, but it requires political oversight. So when you look at these, these issues in terms of financial panics, we're going to cover all of these issues having to do from personal finance into looking at government finance into looking at the, at the financial system and to wh why it is a necessary component of modern economies. And this course is on Fridays at 9.30. How'd I do for five minutes? <laughs> I want to thank our speakers, and I'm going to end today with two reminders and a small confession. Reminder number one, don't forget about the Bring a Buddy contest. You want those Joan Baez tickets. Reminder number two, if anybody that you know could not be here today, we are filming this course preview, as always, and it will be up on our website in its entirety within the next week so people can see it there. And I usually end by saying, thank you all for coming and I'll see you in class. But that phrase has a new meaning for me this year. I will just end by saying that I had a birthday this summer and without telling you more about that, I am now eligible to join you in the Ollie classroom and I will see you in class. Thank you very much.